OK. So instead of uh, minus 5, 5, I can just take minus 10,000, 10,000. Here and it's then then I've actually proved what I'm claiming I proved. Okay, so the bottom line is this is putting together all of the information that we got yesterday about the expected moments convergence to the Catalan number, the variance of um, the moments themselves being small, and therefore uh, we con we can conclude that f of w bar converges in probability um, to sigma. Okay, but. Mind you, we, okay, so let me not go <laughs> forward and just uh, stay here for another second. Uh, we only showed this by doing pass counting and a bunch of other stuff. And for that, you have to assume uh, the existence of moments of every kind, okay? So all the moments are bounded. However, in practice, that's not a requirement for the uh, ESD to converge to the semicircle distribution. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove that I'm going to only keep along as requirements the centering of um, the variables, the fact that the off-diagonal variables have variance one, and the fact that the diagonal variable variables have bounded variance. I don't care what that variance actually turns out to be. It's enough that it's bounded. But I will remove all higher moment assumptions uh, and prove that the semicircle law still applies. Was there a question? Yes. They they can be different, but what I want is that uh, the variance of the diagonal elements is bounded by some absolute constant that doesn't imp that doesn't uh, depend on n. Two, three, ten thousand. Okay. Any other questions? OK. So to this goal, to this uh, uh, end, uh, let me tell you about a beautiful uh, linear algebra theorem, the hoffmann villain theorem. Um, sometimes in your mathematical explorations, you will find you'll stumble across people who will tell you things like <clears throat> linear algebra is an undergraduate subject. Not um, seldomly enough, sadly. But when they say that, you can tell them, just look at the hoffmann villain theorem. Okay? This is a very beautiful theorem, the proof of which, yeah, arguably you can explain it to um, smart, really advanced undergraduates, but you cannot really teach it in an undergraduate class. I would guess not even you know at Harvard and MIT. Okay? Uh, it's a beautiful theorem. It's not terribly hard to explain, but it relies on a few very interesting statements. Like for example, the fact that. Um, the uh, doubly stochastic matrices, the set of doubly stochastic matrices, is convex, and its corners are permutations, permutation matrices, okay? which is not terribly hard to prove, but it's not trivial either. So the whole thing is just a bringing together a very beautiful linear algebra facts to state the following thing. Suppose you have two symmetric matrices A and B, and the, suppose that their eigenvalues are uh, ordered, lambda 1 through lambda n in increasing order, lambda 1 through lambda n of B in increasing order. Then the sum of the squares of the differences of the eigenvalues is less than or equal to the trace, the trace of the square of the difference matrix. This is a perturbation uh, bound, which turns out to be very useful uh, in practice in linear algebra, in numerical linear algebra, and as we see right now, in random matrix theory. Okay. So this is the hoffmann villain theorem. I'll be happy to tell you how to prove it uh, if you want after, after uh, the lecture. If you already know how to prove it, good for you. I like it when people know linear algebra facts. Okay. So, 
So that's going to be uh, our tool. Now, I promised that I am going to remove the moment condition on the variables. To do so, essentially, I'm going to do the following thing. Um, let's see if I can. Er oh, do we have erase? Oh, 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 there it is. An eraser. What I want to do essentially is chop off the variables. Uh, I, I want to pick some large compact set such that uh, I define a set of variables that are exactly equal to uh, my wij's on that compact set, large compact set. But these new variables wij hat will have the uh, property that they drop like a stone right after that compact set, but they keep expectation and variance uh, being um, what they were before, okay? So in other words, if I don't assume that my, vari my, uh, sorry, that my variables have moments of all kinds, that means that they can have fat tails, right? The distributions of these variables can have fat tails. But uh, no matter how fat they are, you can pick some epsilon such that, you know, if you, if you pick some large compact, outside of that, the probability of those variables taking values is very, very small. Okay? So that's, that's the trick. So say so here's minus k, here's k, uh, and I want to pick Perhaps my variables, um, that, so the, the, the distributions perhaps look something like this. Um, uh, and I'll want to pick my, ver my other variables such that they're identical. They're identical here, but then their distributions drop off, uh, drop off fast. Maybe they undergo some sort of a bump right here or to kind of squish in the remaining expectation on both sides and appropriately uh, make the uh, uh, um, variance one, okay? I'll leave this for you as an exercise to see that you can in fact, in fact do that. The important thing will be that these new variables almost always, with the exception of small probability sets, will agree with the old, okay? That's that's what the new variables will do. And actually, they will do more. They will be compactly defined, which means that they, wi they will have moments of all sorts. Okay? So a variable that's compactly defined does indeed have moments of all kinds, it's bounded, etc., etc., etc. And therefore, for them, we will be able to apply the Wigner semicircle law and conclude that their ESDs, the ESDs of the matrix, uh, defined with the new variables with hats, does converge to the semicircle law. Have I said anything surprising up to this point? Okay, so, so that's, that's, the, um, that's the gist of it. I'm going to define this new W hats. And then I'm gonna wanna show that the ESDs of the uh, matrix defined with the Ws is very close to the ESD of the matrix defined with the W hats. Okay, so this is, this is the approximation, truncation and approximation. Okay, so this is what I just uh, mentioned before. And <clears throat> now let's take a look at the following statements. As I truncate my variables, uh, so the distributions of the variables uh, W, A, J, farther and farther out, the expectation of what lies outside goes to zero. And that happens because the expectation of the W, I, J's themselves goes to zero, and the probability of the W, J's being outside of this minus K, K goes to zero, okay? So eventually, what happens outside doesn't matter. Uh, you shouldn't be able to say this for any variables w, i, j, but you have the additional fact that they do have tails because they're squares, the, the variances are finite, okay? 
That's what allows you to make this statement. Is it clear? Okay. Similarly, the same thing will happen with the variances for the same reason. Okay. As k goes to infinity, truncating these variables on uh, bigger and bigger sets means that what, what lies outside, the variance of what lies outside goes to zero. But if you put these two things together, it follows that um, you can pick k, depending on epsilon, um, big enough such that essentially the probability that wj falls outside minus kk is very small. And the probability of wij uh, w, uh, hat falling outside of um, minus kk and being di thus being different uh, from wij uh, is also very small. Okay. Maybe not exactly epsilon here. I should have put a big O of epsilon. Let's say 100 epsilon. A hundred epsilon is going to get us covered uh, in any case, because if you look at how you can define these guys, the probability that wij's fall outside of minus kk is already smaller than like two epsilon, and the rest of it can be made as small as we please. So that means that when you put these two together, the probability that the difference between wij outside of that and wij uh, hat outside of minus kk is bigger than epsilon, can be made smaller than 100 epsilon, okay? So most of the time, they agree, that's the point. Most of the time, the two of them are actually exactly the same. And when they're slightly bigger, well, that's a probability that's really, really small. Okay, uh, you can do this using Chebyshev. So you, you look at probabilities, you do some sort of a, um, um, triangle inequality bound, and then you use Chebyshev, you use variances to prove that probabilities are small. Okay. All right. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at this quantity. One over n, trace of w bar minus w bar hat square. Okay. What is that? Well, um, you pull out an n, you get this, because remember that uh, w bar and w bar hat are respectively 1 over root n w and 1 over root n w hat. So you square that 1 over root n and put it out. That's 1 over, it gives you an additional n here. This is a small case n, not large case n. And that gives you 1 over n squared summation of this uh, these things square should. Let me write it down correctly. Percy, how much time do I have? Okay, thank you. So what do we have? We have one over n trace of w bar minus w bar hat or w hat bar. How did I write it? The other way around. <laughs> okay. Square, this is 1 over n squared, trace of w minus w hat squared. And now let's see what this is. If all the wij's uh, are smaller than or equal to, in absolute value, k, then the wij's are actually equal to the wij hats. So I only have to look at this under the assumption that wij is bigger in absolute value than k. So this can be written as, therefore, 1 over n time, uh, 1 over n squared, sorry, times sum. It's the trace of the square of the matrix. Uh, so that basically means that you're looking at um, um, w, let's see, w, I j one W I J bigger than or equal to K minus W I J hat. Same event, one W I J bigger than or equal to K squared. It's symmetric. They're symmetric matrices. 
okay? So W minus W hat, IJ squared trace of that is going to be uh, W minus W hat IJ times W minus W hat JI, but those two are the same. And that's why you have the square here, okay? And it's solely uh, taking stock, so that difference is zero if Wij is within minus kk, and it has meaning only if you're outside of that interval. So far so good? Okay. But if we go back, we have this, so we can pick we can um, choose k appropriately so that the probability of this phenomenon happening being less than 100 epsilon for every i and j. Okay, so for every i and j, this is, this is the important part, which means that the probability that this quantity here is um, is uh, bigger than epsilon, because you, you're, you have n-squared objects, but you divide by n-squared as well, um, the probability that this quantity here is bigger than epsilon is less than 100 epsilon, okay? So the probability of one over n trace of w bar minus w bar hat squared, which is less than or equal to this, uh, being bigger then epsilon is less than 100 epsilon. Okay, it's small. So now let's look at the complement, the complementary event. Suppose that we're not in this event, we're on the complementary uh, event. So one over n trace of w minus w bar hat squared is less than or equal to epsilon. If that happens, <clears throat> let's take a look and see if I pick a Lipschitz function with constant c, what the difference will be between the uh, um, inner product of fw bar with f and of f sub w bar hat with f. Okay. What's the, the difference between those two inner products? Well, let's take a look at what they are. So f w bar f is going to be one over n summation of f of lambda i of w bar. So far so good. And the same thing will be true for uh, w bar hat. Think about the fact that we've seen um, this, these two identities uh, exemplified on monomials, right? So we've seen them when f is uh, x to the k as one over n trace of w bar to the k, right? But this is true for any function f. Okay. So when I subtract these two guys, Essentially what I'm doing is I can group them in such a way that it becomes a sum of differences of f of lambda i of w bar minus f of lambda i of w bar hat. Okay? Let me write that down. So absolute value of f w bar f minus f w bar hat f is going to be therefore less than or equal to 1 over n summation i equals 1 through n absolute value of f lambda i w bar minus f lambda i w bar hat. Ugh. Okay. 
triangle inequality. Um, <coughs> let's recap. So what is this? This is the inner product of FW bar, so corresponding to the original matrix, whose variables have no assumption of bounded moments beyond moment number two, beyond the variance. And this is the ESD of the truncated variable matrix for which we have moments of any kind, bounded moments of any kind. And the difference between these two numbers is going to be bounded by this sum. But F is Lipschitz. So that means that each term in this sum here can be bounded by some constant, by the constant, uh, fi fixed, finite constant C corresponding to F times the difference of the eigenvalues, of the difference of the eigenvalues. So I equals 1 to N, lambda I W bar minus lambda I W bar hat. Okay? And that's this inequality right here. Okay? That's the benefit of using Lipschitz functions. And now we can go back and use Hoffman Wieland. Uh, what does Hoffman Wieland say? It says that if instead of doing if instead of doing squares here, I take, uh, sorry, if, if I have squares here, then I get the bound with a minus b squared. Now here, I don't have squares. I just have this, right? But I can use, um, what can I use? I think, Uh, some cauchy schwartz kind of inequality, I think. Um, in fact, I'm certain of it because you just square everything. Uh, you, you use cauchy schwartz and that gives you the following inequality. C, so this difference here, is less than what essentially is the trace of w bar minus w bar hat squared averaged out 1 over m. Okay? And as we talked about it, this is the good event. This is the event that happens with probability 1 minus 100 epsilon at least, uh, on which this quantity here is less than epsilon. Therefore, the difference between the inner product with Fw bar and the inner product with Fw bar hat is less than C root epsilon. Okay? But of course, epsilon has been chosen arbitrarily. So what have we shown? We have shown that no matter how small you choose epsilon, you can prove that the difference between these two numbers on a set of probability going to one with epsilon, the difference between these two numbers goes to zero. But that's the same as saying that the ESD of f of w is converging, if this is converging uh, weakly in probability to sigma, then so is this. Because the inner products go to the same numbers. Is that clear? Any questions? So essentially this is why this truncation, putting the, the variables on a compact, putting the variables on a compact has the effect of giving them moments of all kinds, and then proving that if you take this compact to be large enough, depending on epsilon, then essentially the inner product of um, the resulting um, ESD with any Lipschitz function is very, very close to the inner product of your original ESD with the same function, outside of this very, very small interval of, of probability, very, very small. Okay? So that's, that's why now, basically, um, this is the conclusion of the lecture. We've shown that the, semi the Wigner semicircle law happens not just for matrices, for Wigner matrices that have moments of all kinds, but simply for Wigner matrices that have, that are, that have centered variables, variance is one on the off-diagonal, and bounded variance on the diagonal. And that's all you need to know. Okay? 
So this is the, the full strength of the semicircle law. Uh, not tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm not going to see you because we don't have a lecture tomorrow. No, no, actually, I, I guess I'm going to see you, but I'm going to see you outside of this, uh, outside of the classroom setting. Uh, and on Thursday, we will go on and we'll say, okay, so now we see this first order effect. So these, all of these ESDs are converging to the semicircle. But what can we say about the fluctuations from the semicircle? And that's the next question uh, that we'll be exploring. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Jana? Thank you. Thank you.